thanks people for joining either remotely or in uh, is this 8102. Um, yeah, it's, uh, it's great to be uh, back, even if uh, only uh, remotely. Getting applause for uh, figuring out that this is 8102, I guess. Uh, good. So, um, yeah, what did I want to say? Good. So it's, uh, it's always back to be uh, always good to be back at the CMU. Uh, you know, fun to have uh, questions from the audience. Uh, I, I hope that this virtual format will allow the same kind of lively exchange uh, that we've grown accustomed to in uh, CMU's uh, theory lunch. Uh, so as usual, you know, please uh, please uh, stop me with uh, questions. You know, it's uh, always always more fun to have uh, you know back and forth. Uh, all right, so without further ado, let's uh, let's get this show on the road. Uh, so in this uh, talk, I'd like to tell you about joint work with uh, Christos Papadimitriou from Colombia, Tristan Polner, who's now a second year grad student at Stanford, and Amin Saberi, who's my postdoc host. Uh, so Ryan already, Ryan already uh, read the, uh, the title of this talk, which is a bit of a mouthful, so let me not repeat it, but instead let me uh, maybe break it down into uh, constituent parts. So in this talk, we're gonna focus on, let's see, on a uh, two-sided uh, matching market, on a bipartite matching problem in an online and stochastic setting. So this falls under the wide umbrella of online Bayesian selection problems. And in this work, unlike uh, most uh, prior uh, literature, we're going to deviate from the you know, standard uh, way in which we analyze these algorithms, which is via the lens of competitive analysis or in the parlance of this uh, literature, profit inequalities. All right, so uh, quite a bit of jargon. Uh, hopefully all of this will be clear within the next, uh, say, three or four slides. I mean, maybe start with, uh, with the problem uh, formulation to kind of uh, make things uh, a little more concrete, at least like explain the first two lines. Uh, good, so suppose you're interested in selling a house and uh, you're in the following uh, kind of market with uh, fairly uh, impatient uh, buyers. So at every uh, point in time T, some buyer T will enter the market and make a take it or leave it offer of VT dollars for the house. Okay, so naturally you'd like to uh, maximize your revenue. You don't know the future. So you, you know, try, and, uh, try and figure out some uh, reasonable policy. So maybe the first buyer entered the market, offers half a million dollars for the house. It's like, okay, good. Market seems, you know, I guess by Pittsburgh standards, that's, uh, that's a lot of money. So maybe uh, I can, uh, this seems uh, reassuring, but let me maybe wait and uh, see if I can sell out for, for more. So we turn away the purple uh, buyer, the green buyer enters the market, offers uh, six hundred thousand dollars, and saying, "Okay, it's looking better, but maybe, maybe I can do even more. Uh, I can get even more." The next buyer offers significantly less. You're a little disappointed and you're starting to get a little uh, angsty. Uh, then the next buyer shows up, offers a little more than half a million dollars, and you're like, "Okay, fine. Let me let me sell." It. Okay, so you've sold your house. You've uh, collected uh, over a cool half a million dollars. Uh, you're happy. You go and celebrate. You know, unfortunately, the next day, another buyer shows up and says, if only you'd have waited, I, want, I valued this house for $10 million. This is my, uh, you know, ancestral homes. So I don't know. Anyway. Okay, so of course, yeah, you know, you, you break down. Uh, now, a little less uh, facetiously, if you, if you think about this problem for a little bit, you'll realize that there's really nothing you can do, at least the way I've, I've described the problem. Okay, and so what people generally uh, assume in this uh, model to kind of go away from uh, worst case uh, impossibility results is add some Bayesian assumption about the input. You know, maybe maybe you have some historical data and you can kind of learn what's what's likely to happen. So with that let me maybe tell you what's the problem we really are going to look at in this talk, which is uh, the following. We call this the house cell problem. So here you're interested in selling a number of heterogeneous items. In this case, houses A, B, and C. And again, buyers enter the market over time, but now with some known probability PT. So say maybe the first uh, buyer showed up. And when they arrive, again, they make a take it or leave it offer of VT dollars for any one of the houses in their neighborhood. Okay. So again, we have this historical data. We know the probabilities uh, PT. We know the values VT. And we know the neighborhoods N, N of T a priori. We just don't know the realization of the randomness that determines the arrivals of these buyers. Okay, so in this case, uh, I guess we, we do see that uh, this buyer uh, this buyer one entered the market, and maybe we decide to sell them house B. Okay, uh, second uh, buyer enters the market. We can of course no longer sell her house B since it's already sold. We could sell her house C, but maybe we decide to wait, uh, you know, in favor of some some future possibly arriving uh, buyer three who values this house for more money. 
Okay, unfortunately, this buyer uh, didn't enter the market, so we didn't sell houses, but you know, those are the, okay, the process kind of continues like this. Are the dynamics clear? A few people on video, got one thumbs up, two thumbs up. Okay, we'll take that as a consensus. Danny, thumbs up, thumbs down. I have a question. I, uh, yeah, thumbs down. Thumbs down, okay. <laughs> oh, wait. Um, I, I've got my um, paper over the, boy, that's a transparent piece of tape. <laughs> anyway, I, I have a blockage for my, my computer here. Uh -huh. there. Yeah. Oh no. Just a question. Um, what? What? Uh, the, there's a subset. No, there's a set of, and the same price is offered for the, N of T. All the houses in that set. Yeah. We we can we can deal with more general settings, but uh, you know, for the for simplicity during this talk, we'll just assume it's the same value, for all the houses in that set, and zero for everything else. Is that a question? I don't know. And then you sell. Then you can opt for selling one of the houses in the set, you at your own discretion, which one, exactly. and then, and then, or say no to all the whole thing. Yeah. Okay, great. That was, that's it. Perfect, thanks. Okay, other questions? To clarify, the only randomness in the process is whether each buyer arrives or does not, the rest is all deterministic? Yeah, everything else is deterministic. Thanks, uh, thanks for that question. The only randomness is this, you know, Bernoulli with probability PT basically for every buyer team. Again, we can we can generalize this quite a bit, but you know, to kind of make uh, the talk a little more uh, self-contained and a bit uh, less less index heavy, we'll we'll just uh, assume this. Can you sell multiple houses to the same buyer? Uh, no. So this is a, a matching problem. So every buyer can buy at most one house, and every house can be sold to at most one uh, okay. seller. Perfect. Um, good. So hopefully at this point we're clear about the problem. Uh, and naturally what we'd like to do in this, uh, you know, in this setting is to maximize our revenue. So what's, what's known about uh, this objective? So in, for this problem, a number of one half competitive algorithms are known. I'll give you a list of uh, references uh, shortly. But just to be clear what I mean by a, a competitive algorithm in this context, this is an algorithm whose expected gain is at least one half times the expected gain of a prophet who knows the future. Okay, and and this is where this uh, you know nomenclature from uh, from the online Bayesian selection literature uh, comes from. This is you know the profit in profit inequalities. Okay, so there's an inequality showing where at least one half times this profit's value. Okay, so a quick uh, overview of this, uh, or maybe not even overview, a quick uh, sampling of uh, some results in this uh, long, illustrious uh, line of work on profit inequalities. I see Thomas is in the audience, so he could tell you probably quite a bit more. Uh, good. So the first, uh, you know, optimal uh, profit inequality is due to uh, Krangel and Suchestan, who gave a one-half competitive profit inequality for the single item case. Okay, so the simple, uh, simple case of our problem where you're only selling one house. Uh, now, this has been uh, generalized uh, to a number of, uh, you know, more elaborate uh, constraints over the years, uh, mostly uh, recently by the TCS community, who showed how to obtain this for multiple homogeneous items, for matroid constraints, for matching constraints, and many, many, many more. And of course, uh, matching constraints are the most relevant to, to this uh, talk, to our work. Okay, good. So uh, just uh, to recap, for, for the problem we'll uh, focus on in this talk, a number of one-half competitive algorithms are known. On the other hand, the classic uh, impossibility result of Krenkel and Suchestan for a single item shows that this is the best you could hope to, to get. Okay, this is a fairly simple example, so let me maybe uh, quickly uh, kind of illustrate this. So imagine you're only selling a single house and you have two possible buyers, a purple and a blue one. The purple shows up you know, deterministically with probability one, offers you a dollar, the second buyer is a much higher variance, uh, shows up with probability epsilon and has value one over epsilon. Okay, now if you think about this for a second as an online algorithm, say the first buyer arrives, what do you do? You can either sell to this buyer and get a dollar or turn them away and then get a dollar in expectation from the blue buyer. Either way, the best you could hope to do is get one dollar. Okay. On the other hand, the profits or this you know, optimum offline uh, algorithm 
can just look at the realization and say, oh, good. Whenever the blue buyer enters the market, I'll sell to that buyer. So I'll get a dollar in expectation here. And the remaining one minus epsilon fraction of the time I sell to the purple buyer. So I get another one minus epsilon there. I get basically $2 from the setting. Okay, so the ratio between any online algorithm and the profit is at most one half. The example clear? Fairly simple, right? Yeah, thanks for the thumbs up. Good. Uh, sorry, question? Not clear to me for some reason. Not clear to you. Um, I mean, it's not, it's not particularly important, but uh, I mean, if you want, we can, we can maybe take, take this offline. It's just a fairly, fairly simple example showing that, you know, maybe, okay, let's, let's go through it real quick. So again, as an online algorithm, at time step one, you know that this uh, purple buyer entered the market. So, so I don't understand what the profit PR the ah, profit does. I don't understand. He, he, know, he knows Epsilon and he knows uh, that the blue buyer, now the blue buyer is always gonna show up in this scenario, right? No, 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 not at all. The, the blue buyer shows up, I guess you can't see this. P2 is Epsilon, right? So there's a probability of Epsilon that the blue, blue buyer enters the market. Okay, okay. So the prophet knows that, whether he's gonna show up or not. Exactly. And he knows that in particular, you know, when, when making its decision, it, it knows everything. So it just looks at the realization, says, oh, okay, if the blue buyer enters, well, of course I'm selling to that buyer, it's worth a lot more. And wh whenever they don't enter the market, we sell to the purple, they'll sell to the purple buyer. Okay. So get a dollar in expectation for blue, blue and a one minus epsilon in expectation for the purple. What, how is epsilon chosen? I mean, uh, this epsilon could be anything. I'm just saying like for arbitrarily small epsilon. But if epsilon is one, one then, you, the, then the gain can be only one. He can only sell it to one of those two people and he gets one, right? Sure. So what I'm saying here is wrong. Where is that com two coming from? So I'm saying here the, the value is one over two minus epsilon. The best any online algorithm can get is a one over two minus epsilon approximation of the offline. So take you know, epsilon tending to zero, which shows that the best you could hope to get is a one half competitive ratio. Okay. Okay. Happy, happy to chat about this more offline, but I think it uh, seems, seems like we're, we're good. Okay. Okay, uh, so again, one half competitive algorithms are possible and one half competitive ratio is the best you could hope to do. So, uh, you know, why do I need another uh, <laughs> 40 odd minutes of your time? Um, so for that, let me maybe uh, focus on the highlighted uh, uh, words here, best possible. Okay, so all these uh, competitive, uh, uh, competitive ratio uh, guarantees are basically comparing again with, with this uh, profit, okay, with the offline optimum, so who's, uh, you know, all powerful, in particular it's computationally unbounded, and is also all knowing, and in particular knows the future, so knows the realization of these, of these random uh, coin tests. Uh, a much more reasonable benchmark is a, uh, you know, the following uh, character, which we'll refer to as the Titan. So this is the online optimum, it's all powerful, so in, in particular, again, it's computationally unbounded, but similarly to our algorithm, it does not know the future. Um, so if, if people are wondering why uh, I'm referring to this as a Titan, uh, so if you remember your like uh, Greek mythology, the Titans were the pre-Olympian gods, so they were clearly you know, all powerful, um, but uh, well, they, they were uh, overthrown by the Olympian gods, so you know, clearly they didn't see that coming, so they, they're clearly, uh, you know, they don't know, uh, don't know the future. Okay, so... Uh, Jokes aside, so why, why do we care about this uh, online optimum? Well, first of all, comparing with this offline, online optimum is a more apples to apples comparison. And indeed, if you think about this uh, for a little bit, this by definition is the best you as an online algorithm could get. Okay, maybe if you spend, maybe you need to spend like an infinite amount of time or exponential amount of time or I don't know, something, but you know, this is what you could hope to get. Okay, now in, Online non-stochastic settings, these turn out to be the same for every input. There's some online algorithm that just, you know, spits out the right uh, answer. But in stochastic settings, it's, it turns out that these are not the same. And I'll make this a bit uh, a bit clearer uh, shortly. Let me tell you a bit, you know, a bit more about this online optimum. Um, so first, we can compute the optimum online algorithm uh, for our problem. Uh, our problem is a, a fairly simple Markov decision problem. So you know, standard dynamic programming uh, techniques will will give you the optimum online algorithm. Uh, unfortunately, the natural uh, dynamic program here has uh, you know exponential uh, size, and so 
this would take exponential time. Maybe you can do better. Well, it's for some for some special cases, you definitely can do better. For example, for the single item case, the optimal online policy can be computable in linear time. This is a fairly simple uh, kind of backwards induction type of thing. And our question here is basically how how well can we uh, generalize this, and how well can we well, sorry, let me rephrase this differently. What is the complexity of computing the optimum online policy or failing that? You know, maybe we, we can't uh, compute the optimum online policy efficiently. What is the complexity of approximating the optimum online policy? Okay, now the, the phrasing here and particularly the uh, parenthetical might, uh, uh, might suggest some, some hardness. And indeed we show that for our problem under a standard uh, complexity, uh, you know, uh, computational complexity assumptions, it is impossible to compute the optimum online policy in polynomial time. In fact, we show uh, something uh, quite a bit stronger. And our first result is that it is p-space hard to even approximate the optimum online policy within some universal uh, constant alpha, which is bounded away from one. Okay, so I'll give you a second, uh, second to parse this. So, you know, for some special cases, you can compute the optimum online policy in linear time, but in general, p-space hard. Okay, so a bit of context. This is the first hardness result of uh, computing, let alone approximating the optimum online policy for any online Bayesian selection problem. And moreover, this is, you know, the right, the right complexity class. Okay, so this uh, optimum online can be computed in polynomial space. Um, so this is one of these, uh, you know, games against nature. They're, uh, they can, can be solved in, uh, optimally in polynomial space. And here we show that even approximating the optimum is polynomial, uh, is p-space hard. Okay, uh, so that's uh, some, uh, some negative uh, results. On the positive side, we show that we can actually approximate the optimum online policy in polynomial time using an online algorithm within a better than one half approximation factor. Okay, so uh, just as a reminder, one half is the best you could hope to do when competing with this profit. Okay, so we're, we're showing a, a strict separation between offline and online algorithms. Okay, so before, uh, before I give you some, uh, some flavor of, I guess, uh, results too, maybe I'll, uh, I'll pause for some, uh, some questions here. David, what upper bounds are you on? What upper bounds are, so sorry, I'm having some trouble hearing. This is Anupam in the background? Yeah. Okay, so again, what was the question? So you got 51% uh, what's an upper bound and what you can achieve. Ah, uh, good. Uh, so an upper bound is, I guess we never actually unpacked the uh, concrete const uh, constant. There's a lot of dependencies on some other machinery, uh, the PCP theorem, expander constructions and so on and so forth. Uh, I think it's fair to say something like uh, alpha is less than one minus one over a billion. Um, so basically, it's 1.999 and 51%. So you know, there aren't significant hardness results not yet. Yeah, there aren't. Yeah, okay. What is what is significant or not? But yeah, this is. I think both results are in some sense a kind of proof of concept. So you can do better than you know when when approximating. You can do better than one half. And uh, well, you can't get one, basically, or you know, some some constant uh, slightly far away from one. How much of this noise are you guys picking up? Okay. Sorry. Uh, yes, Paul, you have a question. Um, you said you want to talk more about theorem two, but can you maybe give a one or two sentence summary of kind of like what kind of machinery goes into theorem one? Uh, sure. How about, how about or, I, I mean, no, no, do that at the end or anything. I have, I have, yeah, yeah, I have, I have uh, some extra slide for this. Let's just see how we're doing for time and then. But uh, but please do remind me at the end. I I mean, generally uh, running through this, uh, I feel like I, I normally have ample time to kind of go over some extra stuff. But just uh, remind me at the end. Uh, good. Other questions? One question. Yes, so theorem ahead. two only applies to the. Uh, matching problem, it's not going to work for the single item case, right? So the single item case is, oh, I see. Uh, the way I've phrased it, not quite, but uh, the more general problem that we solve captures the single item uh, case completely. So the single item is is a matching problem, right? It was just a very simple graph. It's mm -hmm. basically just a star graph. You've got 
you know, one item you're selling on one side and everybody else has an edge to this one item. Yeah. Okay, wait, so, but I thought you can't uh, approximate. So, because you said that in the single item case, mm -hmm. we can um, actually perform the on online optimal algorithm in polynomial time. Right. I yeah, think. good, good. So, so the result this is getting is, you know, for that setting, you should do that, right? Like for, for that special case, you should just run the linear time dynamic program. But, mm. but what I'm saying is we get this general machinery that will help you do it for much more general settings. Hi, David. I have a dumb question here on the theorem statement. So I understand the statement of the second theorem, but uh -huh. the first one, uh, um, maybe I'm not understanding what, what alpha is supposed to be, but uh, it seems that, you know, the second one is saying that you can get a little bit more than half. Yeah. And what, what is the first one saying that it's piece space hard to do what? Ah, good. So there's some universal constant alpha bounded away from one, such that it is piece space hard to approximate the optimum online within this approximation factor. Maybe, maybe I think uh, to kind of answer both your question and Anupam's uh, from earlier, maybe I should have written that alpha equals like 0.999999 or something. Okay, good. So the second one is saying that it's possible for, for alpha is whatever. At least 0.51. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so alpha is, I, I should be thinking of alpha as like one minus epsilon. Yeah, for sure. Okay. For theorem one? Yes, is I there any, Is there any upper bound to the hardness of this problem? Uh, like you, know, you said an exponential time algorithm for finding up on exactly? Is, is it in p-space? Yeah, yeah. So that's that's exactly what this uh, second line is referring to. So it, it is complete for this class. Uh, you can you can compute this in polynomial space. Okay. Perfect. Okay. Exactly the the questions I'd I'd grown I'd grown to miss it seems. Okay. Cool. Uh, so with that, let me maybe uh, move on to the technical part of this talk. Well, I'll give you a little bit of kind of what goes into this uh, result number two: a better than one half approximation of the optimum online case. Uh, but first, let me give you a, a quick uh, kind of uh, detour through a fairly simple uh, warm up that will give us a one half competitive algorithm. So, one half approximation of the optimum offline. So, for this, let's consider the following uh, LP. I'm having some trouble monitoring chat. So, if someone has a question, uh, you know, feel free to unmute. I just said I have to jump to another meeting, but nice talk so far. <laughs> okay, cool. Thanks. Um, good. So, uh, the Sorry, where was I? Good. So in order to upper bound the profits value, let's consider the following LP, where you should think of XIT as the probability that the offline optimum, the profit, sells house I to buyer T or matches uh, edge IT. Okay, so of course the objective is to uh, maximize your expected gain. The first constraint says that no buyer can be sold with probability higher than the probability that they enter the market. The second constraint says that no house can be sold with probability greater than one. And of course, XITs are probability, so they're not there. Good. Um, so using this uh, LP, Ezra et al. gave a one half competitive algorithm by rounding this LP, and in particular, selling each, uh, each uh, matching each edge IT with probability XIT over two. And I'll give you this, uh, this algorithm and its analysis in the following uh, single slide. So here's, uh, here's the, you know, time step of uh, the Ezra et al algorithm. So at some, at this point we've sold maybe one of the houses and a few of the others are still up for sale. And then what we do is if this uh, buyer T arrives, we pick a single house I with probability proportional to XIT, in particular XIT over PT. If this house is still up for sale, we sell this uh, house uh, I to buyer T with some correcting probability. So don't, don't worry about the exact expression right now, but you could think about this as, house I accepting to sell to buyer T. That's the, where the A is coming from. So maybe we sell this house. Good, so uh, as I said before, this algorithm matches each uh, edge with probability exactly one half what the LP would ask you to, sell, to, to match it with. And so what you get from this by a simple uh, kind of, uh, you know, simple, simple uh, linearity of expectation maybe, is that the probability of I being up for sale is exactly one minus sum of all the previous time steps, X I T prime over two. Okay, now why am I showing you this expression? Well, if you look back up at AIT, 
This is exactly the denominator. Okay, so really what this AIT is saying is cell I to T with probability one half over the probability that I is still up to cell. Okay, now if you want to prove this cell lemma, which we're going to do in exactly one line, there's a fairly simple uh, inductive argument. So at the beginning, uh, you know, no edges uh, appeared yet, so we've, we've matched all the edges with this probability. Yes, Brian. Do you sample with replacement until you find a husband still for sale? No, 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 just one, one shot. Okay, so I do, I do this once and that's it, that's, that's the decision. Okay, so uh, why, why do we get uh, the claim? Any like technical difficulty uh, in Gates? No, I'm, just, I'm just like putting the chat up so that we'll see that. Ah, got it. Yeah, okay. Uh, good, so what, what does the inductive step of this uh, lemma look like? So what's the probability that we sell, okay, that we sell uh, house I to buyer T? Well, first the buyer needs to enter the market, then it needs to pick house I, it needs to find that house I is still up for sale, and then that house needs to accept with what we said earlier is probability one half over the probability that I is up for sale. And uh, if you do a little bit of pattern matching, which I'll uh, spare you, a lot of these terms cancel out and what you get is exactly XIT. Okay, so by linearity of expectation, this algorithm is one half competitive. So it gives a one half approximation of the optimum offline. Yes, Isaac, you have a question. Yeah. Um, are we guaranteed that that A sub IT is going to be less than one? Ah, good, great question. Uh, so if you remember, because of the matching constraint, for every i, the sum over t prime, x i t prime is at most one. Okay. Okay. So we have so, to solve the So yes, this is less than one. Good. That's that's a good question, and this I guess will come up uh, shortly in our uh, you know more general. So in in the end, there's a one half chance that every item is not sold. Yeah, for sure. Okay. Good. Uh, well, maybe not every item, but every item has a one half, pro at least a one half probability of being unsolved. Yeah, yeah, every chip, yeah. Perfect. Good. Um, so again, this gives a one half approximation of the optimum offline. We'd like to get a better approximation of the optimum online. And since we, since we can't do better for optimum offline, so what we need is, at least as a, a step number one, is a, a better benchmark that separates optimum online from optimum offline. Okay, that's, that's the next uh, step. We're gonna come up with a new LP. And for that, we're going to use the following uh, constraints previously observed by Toriko and Toriello, which says the following, if we want to sell house I to buyer T, we need the following two events to happen. It's kind of like bare minimum. We need house I to still be up for sale before time T, and we need the buyer to arrive, right? You need, you need two to tango. Uh, good, and I guess the, the key observation uh, here is that for online algorithms, these two events are independent of each other. Okay, so I'll give you give you a minute to think about this. So what is what is uh, event? What is the event that house I? Sorry, what is what is event one depend? Right, so house I is not sold before time t. This depends on random choices made by the algorithm and arrivals up until time t, which are independent of the arrival at time t. So yes, these are independent of each other. Okay. On the other hand, notice that for the profit, this is not true, right? The offline optimum can say, okay, let me see what happened. And based on all of the arrivals, I'll decide whether or not to sell some. If you remember in our, in our two buyer example that showed that one half competitive ratio is the best you could get, um, the blue buyer is sold precisely when the purple buyer doesn't. Uh, sorry, maybe vice versa, whatever. <laughs> the first buyer is sold precisely when the second buyer doesn't. Okay, good. So, um, so this is, this is a constraint we can add, and this applies to optimum online, but not to optimum offline. So what is this constraint? If XIT is now the probability that I and T are matched by the optimum online policy, then this probability is at most product of the probability that T arrives and that I is still up for sale. Uh, okay, let me maybe uh, mention a few quick observations about this uh, constraint. So maybe uh, foreshadow some, some deeper ones. So for the single item case, adding this polynomial number of uh, constraints to the, the LP that we had before completely characterizes the optimum online pulse. So with, with this constraint, there's, there exists a way to round this fractional, uh, 
fractional solution in an online setting and get exactly a one approximation. Now, uh, in light of our uh, impossibility of our hardness results for the general problem, for, for uh, computing opt-on in the general setting, we don't expect this polynomial number of constraints to capture opt-on, but we show that the next best thing is true and these constraints help us in approximating the optimum online policy. And I'll kind of point out where, where, this, uh, where this pops up uh, later. Okay, so these, these are our constraints that we have, the same constraints we had before, plus this uh, probability that I and T are matched is at most a product of, of these two events. Um, good, so I, I don't think I'll actually unpack this uh, one more time. Maybe I'll, I'll kind of mention where this is. You don't need to commit any of these constraints, uh, constraints to them. Okay, so uh, now that we've got uh, everything in place, let me present the new algorithm, which will extend the Ezra algorithm in uh, a couple, couple of different directions. But the, the, the high level approach is uh, at least going to be the same, and at least like, the first few steps will be the same. Uh, we'd like to round this uh, relaxation of the optimal online policy, and in an online setting, guarantee that each house I is sold to buyer T with probability XIT times something slightly greater than one half. And uh, so one half plus epsilon, and for the sake of this talk, you can think of epsilon as like one over a million. It's just like a, you know some small-ish constant that will make uh, you know all the inequalities work out. Uh, it's not it's not as bad as one over a million in the paper, but you know this, uh, we're, we're not going to see the entire calculations here. Okay, so here's uh, here's the algorithm. So for starters, we're kind of going to follow the approach of uh, Esvaltal. Uh, again, if a buyer arrives, we pick some house with probability xit over pt. If the house is still up for sale, we'll accept it with some correcting probability, which is a function of X and also the particular epsilon that we use. Um, now, normally I'd like to not actually show you this thing, but last time I gave this talk, I was, uh, I had like a few uh, disgruntled uh, audience members who wanted to actually see this uh, expression. So let me tell you what it is, uh, you know, for, for those who really wanna keep track of some of the calculations, this will uh, convince you that things, things work out. Uh, so what is this uh, acceptance probability? It's uh, essentially the same probability we had uh, before, but with all the one halves replaced by one half plus epsilon. Uh, and kind of following up on Isaac's question from earlier, if we only use this expression with uh, you know, the one half plus epsilon, this would no longer be guaranteed to be less than one. So we take the, you know, the, the minimum of this expression to the right and one. Okay, so now it's definitely a probability. And uh, again, since the sum of these XITs is at most one, this uh, right, uh, you know, right minimum is at most maybe one plus uh, you know, one plus epsilon or so. And so this expression, you know, scaling down so you're at most one is always at least basically the same expression on the right up to maybe a one minus epsilon two. Okay, so if you didn't follow this, it's, it's not it's not important. But let me kind of tell you what the what the kicker is here. Uh, so first. If we don't take the minimum, uh, with, if, if uh, you know this minimum is one does nothing, then the exact same arguments we had before show that the probability that I is sold to T is exactly one half plus epsilon times X I T. Okay. Uh, on the other hand, the kind of uh, the, the the inequality on the previous slide, I guess on the when when unpacking this A I T shows that if A I T is equal to one, then this scaling down doesn't lose us too much. Okay, so when we, we're taking this uh, minimum of one and, and what we'd really like to do. So the minimum was one is not losing us too much. It's losing us maybe a, a uh, one minus epsilon uh, multiplicative factor. Okay, so for some of these edges, we're getting exactly the marginal probability we wanted, one half plus epsilon. And for some we're getting, we're close, but we're not quite there. Okay, so we're getting one half you know, minus something. So the, the natural uh, objective is to slightly increase the marginal probabilities of selling each of these houses to, uh, to uh, buyer T. And for that, the, the change we're going to make in the algorithm is uh, fairly uh, innocent looking. And in particular, what we're going to do, uh, kind of following up on Brian's question from earlier, if buyer T failed, we'll repeat the highlighted lines one more time for all the houses that didn't get a, a high enough probability of getting matched. So all the houses I for which the acceptance probability is exactly. Okay, so I don't want to unpack the algorithm, but it's it's uh, basically what's written here. So we do lines one through four. If by a T fail, we'll repeat lines two, three, and four. Is the algorithm description clear? Yes, Isaac. Fail. 
You mean if any of those steps fail, like picking the house, it's still being for sale and the AIT? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so just in case people didn't hear, so the question is, what does it mean to fail? So me, fail for me is I failed to buy any house, me as buyer team. So yes, any any kind of failure. If you maybe uh, you know the sum of the XITs might not sum up to P to PT. So maybe you just you know you picked air. So okay, in that that case you failed, or maybe the house that you picked is no longer up for sale. So that's a failure, or maybe the house is up for sale, but it, you you weren't accepted. So that's also fail, a failure. Okay, so any one of these you know failure events uh, basically means that T can still be matched. So why not try again? And to clarify, when you say repeat once more, do you mean repeat once for each eye with where this is true, or repeat once for an arbitrary eye for which this is true? So repeat uh, once more for an arbitrary. So basically, repeat these lines. So maybe maybe uh, line two could be phrased differently. So I'm picking a house I from a distribution with probabilities from multinomial distribution with probabilities xit over pt, and then for this house, if it's still up for sale, we accepted this probability. So I'm repeating exactly those those uh, those lines with, with the extra condition that I say if house I is uh, still for sale and AIT equals one. Okay, so we don't increase. So there's a significant probability, perhaps, that we wouldn't pick that we would not pick any house. We pick a house that didn't have the AIT property and just go off the line. But if we happen to get lucky and hit an AIT equals one house, then we keep going. Exactly. Perfect. Thanks. Perfect. Thanks. Wait, when you say repeat once more, do you mean like just once more, and then if it fails again, you go on, or like repeat until it doesn't fail? I'm not totally sure of my question. Uh, yeah, that's that's a natural uh, approach. We would just repeat this once. Oh, okay. And then and then go on, no matter if it fails. Again. And then go on. Yeah. I mean, if you fail twice, it's like okay, this this guy's just super unlucky. I don't know what you want. Yeah. Sure. Cool. Um, good. So I guess by lemma one, we're saying that for uh, houses, uh, for house buyer pairs with AIT less than one, the probability that we match these two is exactly what we wanted. So we're good with those. For the others, the probability that we match, basically what's written here is uh, we match as a first pick is roughly one half times XIT. And so what we'd like to show is that the second pick helps us. So maybe let, let me maybe uh, summarize this. So if we denote by M1 and M2, the set of edges or you know, house buyer pairs that are matched as a first or as a second pick, then uh, the second lemma on the previous slide shows that the probability that we match as the first pick is basically one half times XIT. Uh, just a second, Brian. And what we'd like to show is that the second probability, the, the, the probability of matching as a second pick will increase the marginal probability to you know, this one half plus epsilon XIT. So we want to show the this probability is at least say four epsilon x uh, Brian, you had a question. I have a question in the chat. Is there a monotonicity property to repeating sampling house I? That is, you can't get a worse competitive ratio by repeating. Is there a monotonicity? Sorry, can you, can you repeat that question again? Is there a monotonicity property to repeatedly sampling house I? That is, you can't get a worse competitive ratio by repeating. Um, so this, this sum, yeah, that's, that's uh, not clear. I guess uh, it's, it's not clear what the inductive argument would be, for example, to claim that you match uh, each house with some, some marginal probability, right? Like you, you need to not overmatch any particular pair because that would make things, you know, it would make it less likely for this house to still be up for sale later down the line. So I guess in, in short, it's, the answer is no. I think yes. you can clarify that question. Mm -hmm. um, it's not clear to me why the probability of being an M1 transfers yeah. to this setting from the previous setting, because potentially the extra choice on a previous round messes up my choice here. And so then I and, and so then uh -huh. XIT doesn't get picked that would have been picked if not for a previous choice. Right, okay, so there's, there's some extra calculation which I'd like to spare you, but let me let me give you a bit of a flavor of what's going on. So this, um, you know, matching when AIT equals one, let me actually remind you what AIT is, though I preferred not to. 
Um, so uh, AIT equals one means that sum of the XITs is fairly close to one. Let me maybe go like one animation back so there's less clutter. Okay, so um, right, AIT equals one means that uh, the denominator on the right-hand side is uh, say at most uh, one half plus epsilon. So the sum of the XITs are fairly close to one. Okay, so the marginal probability that you're matched as a second pick is you know fairly is proportional to the xit values you have after the sum of your after your fractional degree after the sum of these xits is already fairly close to one. Okay, so if you kind of follow follow the argument from before, then you'll maybe it won't be like one minus one half minus three epsilon; it'll be one half minus six epsilon or something. Okay, so these, these are some details I'm I'm trying to kind of sweep out of the rug, but hopefully this uh, you know you're convinced that there's there's a solution under that rug. Okay, perfect. Um, uh, Paul, you have another question? No. Okay, good. So again, name of the game is to we know we know that the matching as a first pick has a you know decent probability of happening, and the the, the name of the game is showing that the second pick also gives you some non negligible probability. And for that, we're going to relate the left hand side of both of these inequalities. I mean, both of these uh, probabilities of being matched as a first and as a second pick. And for that, I'm going to need the next uh, notation at the top of the slide. Uh, so let's denote by AT the indicator for buyer T arriving, so entering the market, and by F of T an indicator for this buyer entering the market and failing its first pick. So remember, failing means either it picked air or um, you know, the house it picked was already sold or the house didn't accept the bid. Good, so uh, what is the probability that we're matched in the first uh, pick in with, the, these, with this notation? Let's unpack that. Uh, so first, we need uh, the buyer to arrive. Subsequently, it needs to pick uh, house I. It has to find that this house is still up for sale, and then the house needs to accept this bid. Okay. Similarly, we can unpack the probability of I and T being matched as a second pick. Okay. So first, we need the buyer to arrive but fail in its first pick. Otherwise, we don't even try a second pick. Then again, it needs to pick house I. It has to find that house I is up for sale and notice that now this might be correlated with uh, buyer T failing. So this is a conditional probability. And finally, uh, I needs to accept the bid. Okay, so again, the, the probability of being matched as a first pick is, you know, say basically one half times XIT. And uh, so I, I, again, I, I spare the calculation, but if you notice the, you know, both of these uh, expressions look fairly similar. In particular, uh, you know, the purple terms are exactly the same. The blue terms are exactly the same. And the yellow terms are uh, the same, maybe up to a factor of two. Right, so we were talking earlier about every vertex being free with probability. OK, actually, maybe forget the detail. So uh, the, these yellow terms are the same up to a constant, up to, you know, based on some fairly simple calculation. And so really what I'd like to show is that these green terms are essentially the same up to some multiplicative constant. In which case, what we'll find is that the probability of being matched as a second pick is the same as being matched to the first pick times some constant, which for small enough epsilon will be at least four epsilon xit. Okay, so is, is the outline clear? Isaac, yes. Okay. I thought for M2 to happen, we were conditioning on AI being one. So- Yeah, right, right, right. So the, the terms on the right are all, are, are all one, exactly. But you know, I, I didn't want to. Oh, so this whole world is only for edges with AIT being one. Exactly. The exactly. other ones, I, I don't need to even uh, consider this uh, probability of, uh, you know, the second. Oh, oh, that's the stuff we swept under the rug, saying that M one didn't change. So. Okay, great. Yeah. Perfect. Other questions? Okay, so again, the takeaway here is that we need to show that this, these green terms are the same up to some multiplicative uh, constant, right? So that we actually have a chance of finding house I up for sale if, if we find that T is, uh, okay? That T is uh, unmatched, okay? If, if this is indeed so close to one, how uh -huh. close to half, you know, you should be getting uh, much better results, right? Good, good, good. Uh, yeah, so I guess maybe close to one is, uh, is misleading. Is at least some constant is uh, what should be written at the top. 
I guess the approximate here is not so much hiding like minus epsilon terms as uh, you know imprecisions. But yes, you should you should be parsing this as, as at least a constant. Okay, uh, so I'm not going to make this more more concrete because uh, I think this has been uh, enough uh, notation as is. But let me kind of uh, convince you that this this ratio is not zero. Okay, if this ratio is zero, we're definitely in trouble. And actually, what I'm going to convince you of uh, hopefully is that not not only is this not zero, but there's quite a bit of slack and it's quite far away from zero. Okay, so in particular, what I need to convince you is that the following dangerous uh, scenario is, is never occurred by the algorithm which is that we have some buyer T, which always picks a house J, which would accept if it's still up for sale. So with AJT equals one, and J is up for sale if and only if I is up for sale. Okay, so I'll give, I'll give you a second to kind of unpack what's going on here. So actually maybe let me, let me walk you through this. What, what does this condition mean? It means that conditioning on T failing is precisely conditioning on it arriving, picking some house J, which would accept if it's up for sale, but the buyer failed, so the house didn't accept. So that means that the house is not up for sale, which means that I is not up for sale. Okay, so if we're in this dangerous condition, the numerator is zero, so this ratio is definitely not uh, lower bounded by a constant. Okay, so there's uh, basically two kind of uh, scenarios, like sub scenarios where we're worried about here. So I'll, I'll break this down into two. And then you kind of need to combine these. So the first worrying uh, condition is that uh, AIT equals one and T always picks I. Okay, so whenever T enters the market, it will pick house I with probability one. And house I will always accept if it's still up for sale. Okay, so notice this is exactly one of these conditions. Uh, this, this in particular corresponds to J always equals I. Of course, I is up for sale if and only if I is up for sale. Right? Okay, so if, if you want to get a sense of kind of why, why we're worried about this, uh, you know, if, if the buyer fails to match in its first pick, it's because it, it showed up, picked I. I would have accepted it if it's up for sale, but it didn't. So that means it's not up for sale. So what does it help you to pick again? Right? You're not going to find any new information. I is still going to be matched, uh, like you know, previously sold. Okay, uh, good. So I'm, I'm not going to unpack this uh, completely, but basically the, what, what we need to show is that this doesn't, uh, doesn't happen. And indeed, we show that we're quite far away from this. In particular, if AIT is one, then the probability that T picks I is at most, uh, say, 10 epsilon. Okay, and uh, the, the reason for this is uh, the probability that T picks I is XIT over PT. Uh, if AIT is one, then, um, maybe, okay, I'll still, still show you this real quick. If AIT is one, then this sum is fairly close to one. And if this sum is fairly close to one, then this, the probability that I is still up for sale is uh, fairly close to zero in the LP solution. So the probability, XIT over PT is, is fairly close to zero. So I guess uh, I wasn't planning on showing this, but somehow they show it. Uh, good, so this is, uh, again, like if you didn't follow this, it's not uh, too important, but this is basically the, the one place where we use this new LP constraint, which separates optimum online from optimum offline. Good, so that's, that's uh, one uh, you know, special case of this uh, dangerous uh, scenarios we'd like to avoid. Uh, the second one is, is a bit uh, longer to unpack, but in particular, it requires this if and only if, uh, you know, this, this uh, perfect correlation between match st statuses of different houses. And what I'm going to convince you on the next slide is uh, we don't have this uh, perfect correlation. In fact, there's the correlation between two different houses match statuses is fairly uh, low. Okay, so a little uh, more formally, what do we show? If we denote by SI the indicator that house I is still up for sale at, uh, at this particular time point uh, T that we're, we care about, then the covariance of SI and SJ is fairly small. Okay, so here's the, the rough outline. We take these variables and decompose them into the sum of two variables, uh, AI and BI. Informally, you can think of uh, AI as an indicator of I being matched early and BI as an indicator for it being matched late. 
And uh, what we show is that these a AI variables are negatively correlated. Uh, in fact, uh, we show that they're negatively associated. Um, and on the other hand, we show that the probability of event BI is fairly small. Okay, so these BIs are low probability events. And so intuitively, if I tell you that two variables, SI and uh, SJ are you know, the sum of negatively correlated variables plus you know, a tiny little variable on top of this, then you know, in, informally, it kind of feels like they shouldn't be uh, you know, strongly correlated. And indeed, if you just kind of plug in uh, bounds one and two into the additive law of covariance, you get exactly this. So the covariance of SI and SJ is the covariance of AI plus BI, et cetera. So some of the uh, kind of cross covariances Covariance of AI and AJ is at most zero. Covariance of BI and anything is at most the probability of BI, which is epsilon. So all in all, this covariance is, is fairly small. OK, so uh, that was the one uh, maybe like as close to full proof as, as I was uh, planning on showing. But let me maybe just unwind this back and kind of remind you what's, uh, what's the technical uh, takeaway here for, for, this, uh, for the analysis. So what we get from this is that the probability that I is up for sale conditioned on T failing uh, is not too far away from the probability of I being up for sale. I guess all I really showed to you is, showed you is that this uh, probability is not, uh, is not zero. But I mean, I guess I, hopefully I convinced you that there's quite a, bit, quite a bit of slack across the board. So I actually can show that this is at least some cost. Okay, and from this we get our uh, main lemma because uh, the probability that house I is sold to buyer T is the probability it's sold either as a first or as a second pick. The first is roughly one half times XIT, and the second is not much smaller, in particular it's at least say four epsilon times XIT. So overall we get our desired one half plus epsilon times XIT, and by linearity of expectation we get a one half plus epsilon approximation of the optimum online policy by a polytime online. Good, so that's the, the technical part of the, uh, the talk. Happy to answer any questions now, or maybe I'll bring this up to. Yes, Isaac. On the previous slide, when you talked about the study adaptive choices, was that also using the onlineness um, for the independence? Or uh, uh, good. So here, what, what we're using is the fact that you know we we have buyer T picks on house I independently of what happened before. It's exactly one house I independently of what happened before. And uh, the coin toss is also being, the coin tosses for AIT also being independent of what happened before. Okay, so this, this is the other place where we use the comparing against the type and not the property. Uh, no, this is, this is actually, here, here the independence is really saying something about our algorithm, not so much the optimal. Oh, oh. Okay, so our algorithm is uh, online. Is, is it online and so things are independent? Yeah, exactly. Okay, great. Uh, Greg, you have a question. Yeah, so if I'm, if I'm following this, then the, the XITs here are for the probabilities of the Titan rather than the profit. Um, sure. So I guess what I'm wondering is, do you have any hope that uh, this is doing better than like a 0.225 approximation to the <laughs> offline app? And in particular, like, I guess the dream would be simultaneously attaining a half approximation to the offline opt and a half plus epsilon to the Titan. Right, uh, great question. So if, if you're interested in, so let me, let me kind of bring this to the results, which I think is, uh, speaks to, to this question. Uh, so what, what Greg is asking is, uh, you know, we know the optimum online gets at least one half of the optimum offline. So our, our, what is, is what we're getting here is something like roughly a one quarter uh, competitive ratio. Um, now, if, if you don't mind losing, uh, you know, uh, an arbitrarily small epsilon or like a little order of one term, you can basically run both of these algorithms, you know, simulate both of these algorithms and figure out which one does better up to, you know, uh, uh, concentration uh, errors. So, so you can get basically a one half, say minus little order of one competitive ratio and a uh, 0.51 approximation of optimum online simultaneously. Very cool. Okay, I don't quite follow that, but that's uh, that's great. Thank you. Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, okay, so again, the kind of uh, takeaway uh, result-wise is, you know, this this problem is uh, p-space hard, so it's complete uh, for the class of uh, polynomial space. It's hard to approximate the optimal online policy. On the other hand, we can approximate the optimal online policy better than we can approximate the, the profit. Uh, so a few uh, maybe like uh, conceptual takeaways before I leave you with some some natural uh, open questions. I think this analysis in terms of the optimum online policy is, uh, is 
very appealing for uh, people interested in the online algorithms for, uh, for uh, I guess, one, one meta reason, which is that this forces us to have a better understanding of online algorithms in, in two ways. First, it requires us to think about what we can do in polynomial time, which is generally something we, we don't kind of worry about too much in uh, online algorithms, but really if, you know, the way we talk about online algorithms are, uh, you know, decisions are immediate and irrevocable. If your algorithm takes exponential time, it's gonna be hard for you to convince me that your algorithm is immediate, is making immediate choices. So I guess that's, that's uh, one thing that, uh, you know, approximating opt on uh, kind of forces us to do at least in these uh, stochastic settings. And generally comparing to opt online just forces us to think about what op online algorithm can do, period. Right, so if you, if you remember this, uh, this one extra constraint, which allowed us to separate optimum online from optimum offline, well, that's exactly kind of, like, you, need, you need these uh, extra constraints to upper bound what the online algorithm can do if you want to compete, if you want to lower bound your value in terms of the optimum online. So this uh, forces us to think about these kind of uh, valid constraints for online algorithms, you know, some, some clear limitations to what online algorithms can do. And that's kind of uh, maybe uh, leads into the, the, the one meta question I'd, I'd like to pose as a future direction, which is studying the complexity of approximating the optimum online policy. And you can parse this, you know, in varying uh, levels of, of uh, generality. Uh, so as Anupam uh, pointed out before, there's quite a bit of a gap between our upper and lower bounds. So, you know, for the problem that we studied here, you could, you could ask what's the best you could get. Um, I'm sure there's, you know, a lot of, a lot of uh, cool, uh, cool, additional ideas you could throw at this problem from, from both directions. You could generalize this further and talk about online Bayesian selection problems. So in, uh, for example, in EC19, uh, Anari et al gave a polynomial time approximation scheme for some restricted class of uh, matroid constraints, in particular bounded depth uh, laminar uh, matroids. You could ask if you could do this, uh, you know, for uh, if you could get, uh, say, a PTAS for any uh, matroids or, um, you know, any online Bayesian selection problem. And more generally, you could basically ask this for all your favorite online stochastic problems, right? This optimum online is, is uh, well-defined for all of these and is different than the optimum offline. I think it's a, it's a really exciting uh, kind of research agenda for better understanding what we can really do in these uh, online uh, settings. So I'm excited to see more uh, results in this space. And uh, with that, let me maybe uh, pause for some more questions and thank you for it. Thank you. Thanks, Danny. Uh, Isaac, yes. This is not exactly a question, but sort of letting you know about other areas. So in human theory, mm -hmm. um, the online optimum is known exactly and calculable in polynomial time in a lot of settings. Uh -huh. um, and the same is true in a lot of multi arm banded theory. It would be the Gittins index policy. Sure. Um, and then the problem often comes but it often takes something like, you know, quadratic or cubic time in the description of the distribution, which could be too slow. Mm -hmm. So then questions come up of sort of the fine grained version of this question. So can I get um, linear time algorithms or something like that uh, mm -hmm. to approximate the optimal online policy? Uh, Perfect. Yeah, I mean that's that's a, a very appealing question. I don't know if there was a, there was a question other than just raising a, a research question. Uh, um, yes, this is an interesting research question for sure. Right. I, I guess the other interesting part there is that the input in that world um, looks looks very different, right? So the input is sort of maybe a distribution. Oh, it would be the equivalent of having a distribution over values or a distribution over NFT. And then your algorithm is running in time based on the length of that distribution. Sure. It wasn't a question. It was just a no question. question. Okay. <laughs> cool. Uh, so thanks. Thanks for that comment. Uh, Paul, you have a question. Yeah. Can you tell me more about the uh, hotness? Uh, sure. I can. Uh, maybe if there's. Yeah. Okay. Sure. Let me, let me tell you a little bit about this. Uh, so the hardness is based on the following uh, problem. So uh, this uh, stochastic SAT uh, problem introduced by Christos in uh, 85. So here the input is a three SAT uh, formula. And the dynamics are as follows. At every odd time step, the player picks an, assign uh, an assignment for uh, you know, the next variable, 
truth, true or false. And at even time steps, nature picks uh, time step, the, the assignment at random. Okay. So what Crystal shows is it's uh, piece space hard to you know figure out how well uh, the the optimal policy uh, does or you know uh, how close it is to um, satisfying assumption uh, satisfying assignments and expectation. And you can talk about the maximization variant of this uh, max stochastic set where you want to maximize the expected number of satisfied quotes. And in uh, the late 90s, Kondo uh, Natal showed that this problem is actually p space hard to approximate within some universal constant bounded away from one, uh, building on uh, you know, uh, machinery in the PCP uh, literature. And uh, what we show is that uh, kind of using uh, standard uh, expander based uh, tricks is that uh, the above also holds if each variable appears in a constant number of closes. Okay, and then what, uh, what we do is basically reduce uh, the, the bounded uh, number of occurrences uh, instance of uh, max stochastic set to our house cell problem. And if you're curious about the reduction, it looks something like this, but I'm, I'm more than happy to talk about this uh, offline. I, I don't know that uh, online is the best, uh, best way to unpack this. Okay, so this hopefully will give you a bit of a flavor of kind of you know, what, these, uh, what these problems look like. If you want to show p-space hardness of online stochastic problems, then stochastic set or maybe max stochastic set are kind of a natural canonical problem to start with. All right, uh, another uh, question in the back. Yeah. Yeah, okay. Um, uh, I feel like obligated to ask this. If you just uh, have to pick an alpha that you think between 0.51 and 0.999 that you think, where do you think it is? Like 0.75? I see. Um, I, I really don't don't have too much uh, too much to base any any of these guesses on. So I mean, I could, I could pick a random number and just uh, yeah. Okay. Um, All right. Yes, Isaac. Are there sort of suspected hard instances below the threshold you derived um, that you don't know how to approximate well, or you don't know how to approximate the online opt? Good. So the LP that we have has something of a integrality gap. Is maybe not the right term, but has has a gap of the uh, you know, best we showed is maybe like 0.81 or something. So at least using this LP on its own, the best you could hope to get is maybe a 0.8 something approximation. Um, so the, this uh, previously mentioned paper of uh, Turico and Toyello has uh, a number of other constraints, and you could come up with uh, some other constraints of your own, and maybe tighten this uh, this LP. But, but basically, there's, there's uh, this slack all across the board. Uh, the, the, the hardness result is, uh, is, is not tight. The, the, the algorithmic result is not tight. The LP is not tight. There's, there's a lot of room for, uh, for improvement here. So if you're looking for a, for, a fun, uh, for a fun problem, this, I think, is it's one of those. Yeah, I almost wonder if there's some like, computational way to like, test to try to, to try to figure out where the actual barrier is. I don't know, just a possibility. Yeah, so it's not, quite, it's not quite clear. So for the optimum offline, you could you know, simulate and, and figure out what the optimum offline is. So if, if, if you thought, for example, this like LP has, it does have some slack for, uh, for optimum offline, but it turns out to not be problematic. But if, if you were worried about like tightening the, this LP, you could just like sample the marginal probabilities of the optimum offline solution. Just sample, sample the, the input distribution enough times and compute opt a number of times until you have a good sense of what these XITs are. Uh, for the optimal online, it's not clear, right? There's no Oracle access to the optimal online now. If, if you had it, you'd, that, you'd run it, right? That would be the algorithm. But yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a good question. And uh, generally, I think there's, there's a, lot of, uh, a lot of room for exploration here. Let me maybe mention one, one quick thing. Uh, I guess uh, it's just the students left. So maybe I'll, I'll uh, uh, mention uh, one thing that maybe not everyone here knows and might, might find useful. I don't know if... Uh, uh, Ryan still teaches teaches this in uh, um, uh, theorist toolkit, but one one fun uh, like technical tool to take away from this uh, from this uh, work from the from this paper. I guess I didn't have really time to uh, go into details. Is this notion of negative association, which is a, a very uh, a very powerful tool. Uh, if you guys are watching this uh, at home, feel free to take a screenshot. So I've, I have a nice uh, primer about this uh, in my uh, in my website. I don't have time to tell you almost anything about this, but this is basically kind of uh, you know independent or better. So a lot of a lot of places where you 
you were like, oh man, I wish I wish my variables were independent so I could apply a field to like you know turn off and company. Well, this this is the next uh, you know maybe maybe you don't have independence. Well, negative association pops up in a lot of places, and this is a, a tool that's worth knowing. And so if you find this uh, these notes useful, uh, you know, shoot me a text at some point and. Uh, I'm, I'm planning on turning these into uh, into a survey, basically. So uh, you know, if you have any any nice applications of this, let me know.